Hello, hello, and welcome to Peak My Interest, a podcast dedicated to creativity. My name is Scoob Decker, and I am an artist and your host. PMI is an exploration in meeting some incredible artists, learning about their craft, and exploring what makes them create. If you are a frequent peaker, you know that I have been on the North American tour of Hairspray. And if you know anything about Hairspray, you know about the creative energy of the main character, Tracy Turnblad. This tour's Tracy is played by the similarly creative and powerhouse Caroline Iceman. She stuns the crowd with her singing and dancing while also breaks multiple barriers. I have watched Caroline on this tour on and off stage and noticed how much arts and crafts seem to push her. Turns out crafting is her therapy. I sat her down to see how beads, threads, needles, and hot glue inspire Caroline. This episode was recorded on March 27th in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I hope you can look up their work and your interest is piqued. I hope you are having a grand day, and please enjoy this week's episode I've titled Art Feeds Me. Hello, hello, and welcome to Peak My Interest. I am in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, sitting with the Tracy Turnblad. Miss Caroline Eisman, how are you doing today? I am so good. The sun is shining and I'm happy to be here. Fantastic. Please introduce yourselves. Who are you? Where are you from? I am Caroline Eisman and I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri, and I play Tracy Turnblad on the National Tour of Hairspray. hey <laughs> Obviously, your craft is performing, but what is your specialty within your craft? I would say I'm a dancer, singer, actress kind of girly. Um, I'm a performer on stage and I'm also uh, an artist off stage as well. Yeah, and if you don't know anything about Hairspray, <laughs> Tracy Turnblad is the center of the story and Caroline Eisman is the powerhouse for the show. <laughs> she goes out there for at least two and a half hours and she dances and sings her ass off and she brings the audience to her feet every night. Thank you so much. No, of course, it's just the, it's just the truth. <laughs> Oh. What's your background? You said you're from St. Louis, but do you have any education? Yeah. I've been performing since I was six. Ooh. Um, and no one in my family has ever performed before. So it wasn't like a thing that my parents were like, oh, we should... We, we, we know this. It was just like a thing I kind of fell into and I never got out of it. I've loved it so much. I've been performing learning i've been taking dance classes since i was you know a baby and when i was 16 i decided that i wanted to go into this full time and i told my parents and my dad was like what because i'm the oldest kid and so he was sending his child off to college and he was like a bfa in musical theater really not a business degree maybe a business degree with a minor in musical theater he's the most supportive person ever he just didn't get it and he said to me a couple months ago when we started this like the tour, he was like, oh, thank God I listened to what you wanted. Thank God I let you do whatever the hell you wanted to do because it got you here. Uh-huh. Um, I went to Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee, and I got my BFA in musical theater. I graduated in um, the May, May of 2022, and then I landed on tour three months later. Wow. Yeah. Right out of the gate. <laughs> it was amazing. What was your upbringing that turned you into a creator? What, what piques your interest about creation? I have a very creative soul. Art in all forms feeds me. It makes me happy. It brings light into my life. Um, My mother is a super creative person. She has a degree in graphic design, and that was her job before she uh, became a stay-at-home mom. And she has always been like someone who makes the little things brighter with the way her creativity shines. Like, my, my first introduction, I remember, was, like, wanting better handwriting because my mom has the prettiest handwriting ever. She was like, I just practiced until I liked it. And I think that that is a mindset that has allowed me to explore art in many ways and inspired me to continue to do it. Practice until you like it. I love that. One of the reasons why I really wanted to bring Caroline on here is not only for her amazing performing skills, but she is also one of the most crafty people I've ever met in the arts and crafts. And that's something that I love, as that is one of my mediums as well. Uh, She constantly is creating these new projects just to put a smile on nearly 60 different people on this company. (laughs) How 
do you find the time to do all that? It is my therapy. It is, I think I am someone who needs, um, like, stimulation from several different forms. I can't just, like, sit and watch a TV show. Uh I have to have something going on with my hands, which is born out of my ADHD. And so I think having a craft is, like, a healthy way to channel that. And I love to give a gift. Mm -hmm. I love to make a gift. I love, that's, like, my number one form of love languages is giving gifts and making people feel seen. Mm -hmm. And so being able to make something that makes people feel seen, as extra as it may be, is, like, my favorite thing to do. Yeah. We had a little bit of a speed bump about a month ago on tour, and everybody was just kind of in the dumps. And the next day, it was Valentine's Day, Caroline shows up with a box of individually named glasses with hearts on. They were pink with hearts. Everybody had their own name, and they were glue- and everybody was like, oh my gosh, thank you. And I sat there and went, wow, when did you have the time to do that? <laughs> it's funny. I actually had started them the week before because they were always going to be a Valentine's Day gift. Uh-huh. And then we had the speed bump, and I was like, oh, damn it. Are people going to hate this? <laughs> Is this not the time? And it ended up being just a little, like, sparkle I think everybody uh-huh. needed and I mean I thought the funniest thing was Terry our A2 uh, he wouldn't take him off <laughs> I was like, this is the best like it's something yeah. that makes people feel seen it's the little things it it's, is the little it's things the, it's the little things that people don't always appreciate but just that little thought that goes into it mm-hmm. I, I completely appreciate and respect that um, let, let's get into the creation process first let's go into acting how do you start your pr- creation process how do you create a character Oh my gosh, what an incredible question. I think, you know, I've I've had Tracy on my heart for two years. I've been blessed to be with her for the last two years. But even like past that, thinking of the last couple characters I've played, I, I really have found a core of myself within them. I Before I was doing Tracy, I was playing Charlotte in Cinderella, who's the stepsister. And she's just a bubble of fun and she's awkward and she's weird and she people look at her a little differently they're like what are you doing and I think finding like the core of myself the the parts of myself that I can include in her without taking too much away from myself Mm -hmm. that means a lot to me when finding in a character and I think just like looking at what makes them human what makes them real you know we are we are inevitably telling these life sized stories on stage hairspray specifically is a big one and it's easy to look at tracy and be like oh she's just a character she's like a cartoon and i think that takes the fun away from it it takes the humanity away from it we do this every day as our jobs we're blessed to do it every day Mm -hmm. and if you don't have the humanity in that like it's so easy to lose yourself the show is so larger than life like it's it's easy just to watch it and be a part of it and just be like we're just having fun and all this stuff and then you really dive into Tracy's journey and it's deep among so many layers and textures yeah and like I said it's just it's fun to watch you go out there every night and explore that Thank it's you. great before we go back into the craftiness I just want to touch base on success um, I would say you're very successful <laughs> as Tracy on the national tour of hairspray Thank you. but what is success to you in performing I find a lot of success in being grounded and rooted on stage. Um, I am a firm believer that this art is going to be different every night. And I am also a firm believer in that everybody's path looks a little different and nothing is linear. I hold on to this grasp. My, My like rock lately has been the saying, what is right for me will not pass me by. And so I know that, you know, like I find success every day by being the best Tracy I can be, by bringing the most honest and true performance to the stage. And if long term success looks like, you know, continuing to grow in my performance, continuing to be, be an art, like all I want to do is be an artist on stage. I find success in the fact that I get paid to do my favorite thing in the whole wide world. And I'm 24 and I'm, I'm touring the countries. Mm-hmm. Like that to me is perfect. And, I, and I, there's more I want to do. I want to take that further. I want to reach further lofty goals, but I don't find the need to name them because I find the, I find solace in knowing that what's meant for me will bring success of its own. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Obviously, 
financial is a huge part of oh success. My gosh. <laughs> so let's, yes. let's transition a little bit into your craftiness. Talk to me about your creation process within your craftiness. How do you come up with a project? How do you come up with these ideas? Yes, I love, well, several things. There's, there's the craft that I do for my personal enjoyment, and then there's the craft that I do to make money. I have, I started a side business that really birthed itself out of COVID. It started before then, but it really, it came successful when I was stuck at home in St. Louis at my parents' house, living with my siblings and my parents for the first time since I'd moved to college. And I couldn't perform and I didn't think performing ever was ever going to happen again. And I was the kind of girl, because I was a sophomore in college when everything happened, that almost gave up. And I needed artistic stimulation. I needed artistic fulfillment. So I started painting. I actually started doing chalk art for people outside of their houses. People would hire me to go to other people's houses and make chalk art for Mm. them. So I did baby showers and birthdays and Father's Day chalk art, which was so much fun. It was beautiful. It was really random. But it was summer, and it was St. Louis, and people love each other. And so they were like, hey, my friend's about to have a baby. Will you go make, like, a welcome baby sign on their on their uh, driveway? And I was like, yeah. And I got paid a couple bucks to do it, and it was fun. It was something to do. And I love to paint, and I have always painted denim jackets. That's been a medium I've always loved. Um, and people find a lot of fun personalizing that. Like, that's something so many people want because you can do you can put basically anything on it but I started painting champagne bottles and people would buy them from me and it is my favorite medium to paint actually um I'll have to show you some pictures yes please they're they turn out pretty cool and I painted them for anything I do a lot of uh, birthdays a lot of college graduations probably weddings weddings are huge um but I've done like I'm trying to think of like some really random ones I've done that just turned out really, really cool. And so I would paint them and I would put a big bow on them and then someone would come pick it up. My mom would put them on her Facebook and her friends were like, oh, I'll take six. And it has been this insanely successful side moneymaker for me whenever I go home. My mom will post on her Facebook, hey, Caroline's home for however many weeks she's making bottles and people would be like, sign me up. <laughs> Um, so that has been amazing and I've always loved to paint and that's been a really, really good one. Uh, and then my like personal enjoyment craft is needle pointing. Yeah. That is my, uh, it started on the road because I, last year I was the standby for Tracy Turnblad. So I performed once a week and the rest of the time I was sitting and waiting and I don't do well with idle time. (laughs) So, um, I painted our wall tags, Mm -hmm. um, and then I found myself needle pointing and I it is so mindless, and it is such a fun gift to give. Oh, my God, I'm obsessed with it. Caroline and I, we do dueling crafting when we travel on the bus. She yes. sits close to me, and I'm furiously crocheting away, and she's needlepointing and cross-stitching. <laughs> it's, it's Our section of the bus is the arts and crafts section. Oh, it's the best section of the bus. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about success in your crafting, something that's more of a personal project versus your career, where you are getting paid, or your other crafts where you are getting paid? Yeah, I I find, once again, I love to give gifts. Like, I love to craft to give gifts. Um, And so the success, like, right now, it's finding the perfect needlepoint canvas for, like, my mom or, like, to give my grandma for Christmas. I love their independent needlepoint artists, so, like, all the needlepoint canvases start out as a hand-painted canvas. And in my time post-tour, my goal is to learn how to paint canvases oh. myself. So that's a goal I have. It's not really a, a road hobby, because I would have to travel right, everything right, with me. Yeah. But I will hopefully paint. But there are these phenomenal artists that create such, like, fun art. And I follow them all on social media. Uh-huh. And one will pop up, and I'll be like, oh, that is the perfect canvas for so-and-so. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to, I, I, I gotta get it, I gotta stitch it. Right now I'm stitching a, a passport stamp of, from Paris that is for my best friend who's working at Disney Paris. I've been watching you work on that for a oh, long time. I'm almost it's, done I with it. I cannot wait to see it. It's gonna be really, really cute. So it's like, you know, these, I love to celebrate milestones for people. And getting to celebrate a milestone through my art to give to them is like, I think, the ultimate gift. Yeah. That's incredible. I love that. <laughs> What gets your creative juices flowing? What inspires you? Oh, my gosh. All kinds of things. Places I am. My mom's a photographer, so I think she's really inspired by what's around her. Sure. Uh, And she loves to photograph people. 
And I think people are the ultimate inspiration. Once again, you know, like finding someone that connects you with someone else. Um, yeah, as an actor, that's that's your job. You're you're watching people and studying them and putting that into your next character. For sure. Yeah. And like my favorite wall tags I created last year. Um, a wall tag is you know when we tour through these venues. They, a lot of times there are paintings up on the wall that every cast member signs so you can go through the halls of these venues and see who's been there before you and last year I had plenty of time on my hands and I would paint wall tags as much as I could and my favorite wall tags I made were created in honor of the people in the company with us we went to Auburn Alabama my best friend Addison is from there and she played Miss Baltimore Crabs last year and I painted the crab crown that was our wall tag and it turned out to be one of my favorites because it was like this little piece of Addy that was left behind. And I think, you know, people are so inspiring. Yeah, I, I, me and actually the Tracy standby this year have been taking on a lot of the wall tags. They've been so good. And it it is really fun to kind of either get a a, a little theme within that city, whether that's somebody from your companies from there, or there's just something about the community that you try and incorporate. But what's interesting is one of my former guest that I've had on Peak My Interest was a mural artist. Oh, no way! And I picked her brain constantly about mural art and how that can translate into wall tag art. It is so fascinating. And it's just so, it's so fun to see how different artists can just help each other out. I was here in Edmonton a week ago on press with one of our press reps, and she was amazing, and she was so fascinating because she's a PR agent, and she has all these um, clients, and Broadway Across Canada is one of them. And... Cirque du Soleil is another one of her clients, and she was telling me about a PR installment they did where they had a mural artist go watch the Cirque show and then paint an, a mural based on that Cirque show as, like, a advertisement for it. And I was like, how incredible is that? That is amazing. Art inspiring art. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's very cool. Now, not everybody gets to have all these creative juices, but as an artist, we always run into a wall. How do you overcome a creative block? Ugh, my God, it's really hard. <laughs> um, I think pick. I think dropping, being being able to put something aside and pick something else up until you're back, and re inspired by it is important. And I'm not very good at that. I'm a control freak. I'm a start to finish kind of girl. Once I start something, I want to keep going until I stop it. And I think being able to say, it's not working for me right now. I got to move through. Unless you have a deadline, obviously. And then you, like, do your best work. But it's not working for me. And hoping that you'll come back to it yeah. some in a, in a moment when it's when it's meant for you. Yeah. It's it's tough. Like, we, we had mentioned a little speed bump earlier and sometimes that happens in the middle of a show Mm -hmm. and that can just kill any kind of creativity any kind of momentum do you have any advice for something like that something that happens just that quickly how do you overcome a problem like that in creative world i've learned a lot about like in this in the sense of a show you got to keep going there's no time to stop there's no time to breathe there's no time to freak it's go And I've learned a lot through this experience. This is the longest running show I've ever done. I've done over almost 200 performances of Hairspray. And not every single one of them is going to be perfect. Not every single piece of art is going to be perfect. And that is like, I mean, I think art is the enemy of perfection. I think we have to let go of this like concept of what perfection is when you are doing a form of art. And so I think in terms of performance, you know, like, It's not going to be perfect, and that's okay. But knowing that you can find moments of good in what doesn't feel great, find moments of creativity in that creative block, being willing to switch things up and say, okay, this this tactic is not going my way, so I'm going to have to pick a different tactic. I am having a horrible night. I'm in a horrible mood. i got to find something that's going to bring light and fun to it, whether that's joking with a castmate on stage, whether that's adding up a new vocal option. I mean, within Razo. But <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I, I do think that is your craft. I think that yeah. you are such a, a, like I said, a powerhouse for the show, but also a driving force backstage for people. Thank you. I, I do think that you bring that positive energy with not only your crafting, but your personality as Thank well. Thank you. What we do is way too hard for there not to be levity behind it. Right. 
And when you have those speed bumps, you got to be like, okay, well, we're here. It's over. It's either stopping or it's going and getting over it and yeah. keep going. Let's treat it as a speed bump rather than a brick wall. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. What hobbies do you have? <laughs> I know this is a little uh, double-edged sword because that's kind of why I brought you on here. Crafting. Crafting. <laughs> Crafting, traveling. What else do you like to do? Do you like to go outside? Do you like to explore the world? Obviously, on tour, you're going touring, yeah, seeing I, city to city to city. I love to explore. I love to find a local coffee shop. I love a boutique. I love a hike. I love a book. Mm-hmm. I read a lot. Not a big movie girl, but I like to find a fun TV show. And I like to... I take myself on a date every week. Um, on Sunday nights, I have off the show. And mm-hmm. I spend time alone because we spend a lot of time together mm-hmm. as a company. And I find I found it's really been good for my mental health to um, take myself out and explore the city and see yeah. what I can find. That's great. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. You have that opportunity as yeah, well. Yeah, I'm very lucky that I do. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> She's a legend. <laughs> Going a little bit further, is it recommended to go to school or take classes to build on the craft of performing? I think it's a double-edged sword. Mm-hmm. I think some people really, really benefit from it. I needed four years of BFA education. Looking back, I think as an 18-year-old who had been performing since she was six, who had been around an equity acting world since I was 10... I had a lot of exposure to experience, and I was like, I'm ready to go. Put me on Broadway, coach. And I think, like, in a sense, that, like, green energy is really exciting and important, but also I needed <laughs> I needed social experience. I needed to know how to be around peers. I needed to learn how to shape my voice and my skill. I think there are some people that come out of the womb and are like ready to rumble and have that i that iconic mind space that makes them a good not only actor but coworker but i think for a lot of people going to school and shaping that is super important but i think that can happen in a lot of forms whether yeah. it's 4 years whether it's 2 years whether it's class whether it's whatever mhm yeah it's I, personal i i get that like School is definitely to learn, but it might not be the greatest place to grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's different for everybody. And I needed, I went to school in a you know major metropolitan. Nashville is a super artistically inclined place. And I needed artistic simulation outside of school too. And that was really, really positive for me. Um, I had a job that allowed me to be artistically stimulated. I had um, working experience with actors around the city, with dancers around the city. I was constantly had my nose in some random side job, and that was really beneficial for me, and I learned a lot from that. Hmm. Oh. All right. I'm a multitasker. To do as much as you can and gain as much as you can from Always. each one. I'm going to focus this towards your craftiness, actually. <laughs> do you have advice on getting educated for newcomers? I bring this up because I feel like the biggest uh, setback for people before they start a craft is, well, I'm not artistic. I'm not creative. What's your advice for somebody who doesn't feel like they have that artistic? I hate I hate that mentality. It makes me so sad because I think every single person can be creative. It just you have to look at it from a different scope. My little sister is 17 years old and she is not as artistically inclined as my mom and I are in the same way that we are. We love paint, we love to write, we love those things. Carter is like that's my little sister. She is so artistically inclined in like a fashion sense. She puts together like outfits and like she dreams of decorating homes and these really, really cool things, but she'll always be like, I'm not artistic. But I'm like looking at it from a scope of art is only one thing is so negative. Like we can all be artists in different ways. And I think if you want to get started in something like painting or needle pointing, A, YouTube is your best friend. There are so many people out there who are willing to share. And start at a small scale. We don't have to start painting 60-foot murals. We want to start painting small canvases that are pictures of the fruit in our living room that we can look at and be inspired by. And then you can go out and be inspired by the sunset and paint that. And then you craft and hone your skills and it gets easier. Yeah. And we're going to mess up to this day you know like on stage too i make a mistake every single night and if i didn't i wouldn't be a live performer you wouldn't be human no yeah 
And then what fun would that be? Who wants to see a robot on stage? Boring. Well, go to Disney World if you want. Who knows what AI has got? Oh, so sad. We'll get into that a little bit later. How do you handle criticism? I'm sure you've gotten quite a bit of it, as Tracy. (laughs) I've been very lucky um, in the sense that I was encouraged early on not to look at reviews because I think that's like the most palpable form of criticism. If If you look at criticism from like our creative team, that's hard. But they only want us to be better. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the mentality of I earned my spot. So I just continue to know that, like, I can only be the best Tracy that I can be. In that sense, I think criticism is constructive. If you're looking at people around the world who see our show, not everybody's going to like them. Um, Early on, I was told, you know, don't read reviews. And I decided that that was going to be a part of my process. And then I made the mistake of reading one in Cleveland the week before we left for break. An hour before the show started, and they had not very nice things to say about the show. And they had really weird things to say about me. He said, Caroline Eisman, who has no Broadway credits, her chunky cheeks, and said something else about my performance. And it crushed me. And I was like, what the hell does the way I look... I mean, obviously this story is very important to... I have to look a certain way. Why do you have to put that in your review? If you don't have anything nice, don't say it. But then I was like, you know what? Who cares? Several other people, I don't care what a reviewer thinks. Like, quite frankly, yes, I mean, I do care. Everybody cares. But, like, it's inevitably I care what the little girl in the front row thinks who wants to play Tracy someday. She's the one who's being inspired by this. She is who I was 15 years ago. That's whose opinion of this show matters to me. Not some reviewer in Cleveland who thinks I have chunky cheeks. Go ahead. I do. And I'm proud of him. <laughs> <laughs> that is the show in itself. Also, funny enough, Cleveland was one of our just biggest audiences. They were they loved the show. And they loved the show. <laughs> Every night was an eruption. And my you know, my mom has been reading the reviews all year and sometimes she or my dad will send me a good one if they think it's like, Hey, like you should read this, it was a really positive one. Which I really love. I think yeah. it's sweet that they <laughs> that they want to know what people are saying. But I called her after I read that review in tears. And I was, like, putting my makeup on for the show. Like, I was at the theater. And, and I was like, Mom. And she, the, my whole house, my sister, my dad, and my mom were all in the kitchen. And they had already read the review. And they had all decided, don't say anything to Caroline about it. And they were, my mom was like, I know, but it's fine. And she was like, and I read his other reviews. And he doesn't like theater very much. <laughs> and he just, like, I was like, maybe he's just... Maybe he had a bad day. Maybe he really just doesn't like hairspray. But I'm sorry I couldn't be the Tracy he wanted that day, but I'm really not that sorry because everybody else seemed to like it enough. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. And art's subjective. Mm-hmm. Who art cares? subjective. <laughs> but it's a funny joke. I, every, time, every once in a while, every time I'm like, I've done something bad on stage, I'm like, me and my chunky cheeks. I just messed up that dance step so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? You get it right the next day. Yeah. That's the beauty of this. Are there any misconceptions about your craft? You had just mentioned crying a little bit while putting on some makeup, and my biggest thing for uh, non-theatrical folks is realizing that this isn't the most glamorous life of Mm -hmm. all time. At all, actually. (laughs) Yeah, I think, like, it's hard work, and it's not glamorous, and not everybody loves each other. (laughs) But, uh, like, also, though, on the flip side, it's not as cutthroat as people make it out to be. There's a lot of levity and light. And I think people in our industry determine success in one specific way. Being an equity actor on Broadway from the time you turn 18 and you don't even need anything, but you do need a Tony Award, you know, like stuff like that. Like that is success. And I think finding success at a global state, at a national way, you know, you doing an incredible job in your local show, that's success. Not this, like, version of success that, that our industry sells you. Mm-hmm. And, and again, success looks very different for very many people. But being artistically fulfilled, to me, is the ultimate success. Mm-hmm. That's a common misconception. Yeah. Is there anything about Tracy Turnblad every night that you have to do that you just think people would find interesting? Mm. Tracy's, like, the hardest role I've ever done. Yeah. It's nonstop. And I've learned a lot being with her. 
I've learned a lot of time. I've learned a lot of patience for myself. Um, you know, the importance of sleep and maintaining my life because I get the honor to work in a theater, but in order to be paid, I have to show up to the theater and do my job well, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not just in Edmonton to have fun for the week. I'm in Edmonton to play Tracy. Yeah. I'm trying to I'm trying to think of any fun facts. Oh, I met the original Tracy last year. Oh! Before. All the original Tracys. I, re I met Ricky Lake, who played Tracy in the 1988 movie. I met Marissa Jarrett Winoker, who was the original Broadway Tracy. And that was iconic to see these women who have shaped this girl yeah. that I'm now, I now get to get to sit in her wow, shoes. Oh, the history. There's so much history behind Hairspray and Tracy I've learned. I'm like a Hairspray historian at this point, I think, because I've listened to all these little tidbits yeah. and I take this information I love. I love history. I love these stories. And Matt and Robbie and Leonard tell them better than anybody else. Um, that's our creative team. Yes, that's our creative team. But, you know, we, Tracy is a, over her 20 year history, she's been a very small pool of girls. And I find myself with the honor of currently sharing her with this group of women. And just getting to meet them across the country has been such a joy. Th that's got to be a really cool feeling to, to so be able cool. to see the history, feel the history. And then take part in the history. Very much so. That's, that's an honor. Yeah. I, I will also say before every night, before you crawl into your bed, because that's how the show starts is with Tracy in bed, Caroline goes around and gives high fives, fist bumps, hugs. And like I said, she Tracy is the driving force of Hairspray, but Caroline is the driving force for the tour. And it's I, I just think it's it's really cool what you can do for this company. And... Not only with your performing, but with your craftiness. Thank you it so just much. just warms everyone's heart. Thank you. Off the top of your head, do you have any funny or interesting stories or events that have happened within your craft? Oh my gosh. My favorite hairspray story to tell is uh, when we were in Florida performing the show, like the third night. I sweat both of my microphones out. <laughs> Nobody could hear me. And I am very acutely aware of what happens off stage. That's like my biggest fault as a performer is I get easily distracted. And I saw people running around backstage and like being like, pull her off, pull her off, pull her off. And I, I knew that nobody in the audience could hear what I was saying. And we were in the scene called Detention. And there's a, a moment where Seaweed, Jay Stubbs, teaches Tracy a dance move. And it's the hello my name is. And he teaches her a move and along with it he says hello my name is Siwi J Stubbs and Tracy's supposed to respond hello my name is Tracy Turnblad and I was so distracted by what was going on on stage I said hello my name is Stacy Turnblad <laughs> and I knew immediately what I had done and I came off stage and they stopped the show so they could switch my mics out and I said to Josiah Rogers who plays Seaweed I said <gasps> Josiah, did I just call myself Stacy? And he was like, no, babe, you're fine. And everybody backstage, I'll give him to that. They they maintained that I had done the show like I had never messed up. And I just had this pit in my stomach for the rest of the act. I was like, I know. I called myself Stacy. And I came backstage at intermission and my uh, my iconic, iconic friend who sh shares Tracy with me, Amy, she's the standby for Tracy Turnblad. I looked her in the eye and she couldn't make eye contact with me. <laughs> And I was like, tell me for real. I said Stacy, didn't I? And she goes, I, I can't lie to you, you did. And uh, I was that's like, funny. that's so mortifying. Oh, and then as soon as Caroline left, we all decided backstage that the rest of the show was going to be Stacy turned. Yeah, I, it's, it's like an iconic. It's a lore. <laughs> She's Stacy. She's a moment. That's incredible. <laughs> What's next for the world of your craft? I usually bring this up because of technology. We're starting to see technology in the world of theater. Where do you see technology going in theater as well as in crafting? Mm, I hope it doesn't go very far in theater. I hope, I think technology is a brilliant tool to share what we are doing with people. I love to post my needle pointing and my painting on Instagram. And I think, um, you know, for those of us who are like independent artists who are making money off of our craft, are like physical craft, you know, painting, crocheting, needle pointing, media and technology is a great tool to sell. It's a great tool to make connections and it's a great tool to have an audience. I worry about the future of a physical art if AI and technology are involved. Um, 
I have a good friend who's a who's a film editor, and he is really worried about the future of AI in film. And I, I, I can't I can't even imagine how crazy that is to think one day your job will be null and void because a computer can do it better. And I hope that, you know, as live performers, they, I, mean, I don't think that they can make holograms of us and put them on stage well, yet. It, it, take our show, take Hairspray. The transition from Broadway to the 20 plus years on tour, they had actors on scaffolding, dancing, yes. and now we have just this big video wall. Yeah. Where we can just project whatever we want on it. We cut all those scaffolding. We cut all those dancers. Right. Which, in a way, I think, like, in order for art to adapt, that scaffolding was really crazy. And they were able to do it on tour when they were doing multiple weeks sits. But the concept of being it being put up for a one-nighter like we have done in our schedule, it, may, it makes me feel unsafe, you know? Like, mm-hmm. hey, that's a lot of safety concerns and issues. So in that sense, I'm like, all right, put them up on the back wall. But if we were to start cutting dancers from the show, like physical people, like, oh, we don't need a Lorraine anymore. Oh, we don't need a an IQ anymore. That would break my heart mm-hmm. because that breaks jobs off and... I often say, you know, my Tracy is nothing without the people around her. I think Tracy would be infinitely less exciting if she didn't have an ensemble behind her. Because our ensemble is insanely amazing, and each one of them has a specific personality that they bring to Baltimore every night. So if you start cutting that, like, that's boring. That's miserable. Nobody wants that. It's, it's, we keep saying double-edged sword in this conversation, but it is because... To be able to have the accessibility to go into a one-nighter and say, well, we have this technology to just give that same effect. Mm-hmm. But then we're starting to see it slowly go even further. To right. be like, well, we, if that's the case, then we don't need these people. Right. Or we don't need that set piece. The biggest and, thing is, like, musicians to me. Like, that scares me. Yeah. Like, I... When I was a senior in college, I did 42nd Street, and I went to a big music school, and we had a, like... 28 piece orchestra that's 28 people performing with us every night and now those jobs are being taken over by electronic instruments and one by one the orchestras and the bands are shrinking and i hate that concept like i'm like "Uh uh-uh we 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 spend our lives honing these skills only for them to go away to Mm -hmm. save a a couple dollars i hate it yeah it makes me want to cry we can always just hope that we can find our roots with live performance and music yeah. and dance. And... and I think, you know, since the since this dark day of the pandemic where nobody was able to perform live, we've created a culture of people who, who see how important that is, how important that live art is for audiences and enjoyment around the world. And I can only hope that as new generations grow that continues to be seen as an important part of life. Mm-hmm. I think so. I, 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 I hope so. I Me think too. so. <laughs> and what's next for you personally? Mm. That's Obviously, the, that's the question on, the on everybody's for a while, lips. But Yeah, we have three more months left on tour. Mm-hmm. Um, and my journey with Tracy ends on June 30th. And I have started to get really emotional thinking about it. And I'm going to cry if I think about it a little longer, I think. But... On that same plane, I've been playing Tracy for two years, which has been amazing. I've loved every second of it, and I'm super excited to see what's next. I find myself wanting to be in an ensemble again. I find myself wanting to play all the roles that I can. My lifelong dream has been to move to New York City, and it's never happened because I booked Hairspray right after college, which was amazing. I wouldn't change that for the world, but now I'm like, I get to move to New York City. (laughs) There are audition rooms that I'm finally being seen in, that I'm I'm like honored that I get to be seen for these projects. I'm like, I wanna do that more. My like lifelong incredible goal, I've spent every birthday candle wish, every eyelash wish is being on Broadway. And that's just something I've wanted for forever. And so hopefully that is something that I achieve soon. But I just want to be an artist in New York. I want to be in artistic communities around the country, actually. Um, I want to meet people and do new jobs and 
yeah, I, I'm excited to be back into that pool. Yeah. I'm really excited. Closing the chapter on Tracy, but yeah. opening the book on... She'll be a part of me forever. Oh, absolutely. It never ends. Hairspray is with you forever. It's just kind of like that sorority of Tracy's you Literally. were talking about. You'll always be part of that. Um, and but nobody can take that away from nobody you. Nobody can take that away from me. But I really, you know, I've spent the last two years being defined by a character who is defined by her body, um, which has had its ups and its downs, its goods and its bads. And I'm, I'm honored to be part of that. But I'm excited to be more than that Yeah. for a little bit. Yeah, to be Caroline Eisman. To be Caroline Eisman. She's a pretty cool girl, I think. Where can we see your work or work like it? Oh, well, my art, I post on social media all the time. Like, at least painting, needle pointing, my Instagram, follow me, Caroline.Eisman. But for live art, you got to come out and see Hairspray on tour. We have, like, the best schedule ever for the next three months. We're going to some amazing places, including Nashville, Tennessee, including which I'm really excited about. Nashville. Um, so come see Hairspray. Uh, and go see live art anywhere. You know, theater is alive and well around the country in every community. If you don't think it's there, look for it. It is. Mm-hmm. And I can't recommend to you enough how important live art is to see and how exciting it is. I try to see something as much as I can. I, I constantly want to see other people creating art. And it doesn't just have to happen in New York City. It can happen anywhere. Yeah. I agree with Caroline. I think because of the pandemic, there was a lot of artists who were restricted that were held back. And now that things have lightened up, we're going to start to see a little bit of a renaissance. I think we're going to get some new art forms coming up. I think yes. we're going to see some crazy awesome things in the theater world, in the dance world, in the music world. I'm so excited for it. And it's we're about to hit summer, which is like, summer stock season so theaters around the country are going to be open and doing art and these college kids who are you know getting their degrees in musical theater or just starting their careers get to perform outside of their school and I think that is like some of the best art to find because I have people who have been with me since those days I the summer after I graduated college I was in Grand Lake Colorado which is this tiny tiny town two hours north of Denver Colorado and I met so many people, and I booked Hairspray while I was there, but I was pre- there performing at a theater. And those people came to see me in Hairspray two years later when we were just in Denver. So make connections with the people who are working at the theaters near you, because you never know where you're going to see You them never next. know. It's so cool. Even the tiniest theaters always have some kind yes. of connection. It's, it's a saying that we always say, but it's a small world. It's a small world. It's, small. it's huge, it's massive and scary, but it's a small world. Firm believer. Yeah. And friend everybody on Facebook, because you never know where you're going to see them go. Yeah, connections. Yeah. You never know what other people are going to do, what other people can open your mind up to. What, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. I can't thank you enough. For joining me and piquing my interest. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? Ugh. Art. Art is important. And art is accessible to everybody. Don't be afraid of it. I've also ended my interviews with a new question. If you could excel at any craft other than your own, what would it be? Playing an instrument. Yeah? I mean, it's technically performing, but it's a different sector. It's a different medium. Um, I I, I had to take piano in college, and I sucked at it. And I wish that I would have started younger. That or like ice skating. Oh, okay. That's like a different kind of art. Another form of craft. Thing. Yeah. What instrument really speaks to you? I mean, I think piano is like super accessible and really successful, but I would love to play guitar. Ooh, yeah. I think I I think I could possibly be good at drums because I have a really good internal internal rhythm, but a guitar would be really yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> It's never too late to start. It isn't. Maybe maybe someday. (laughs) Thank you again. And thank you to all my peekers out there. Please let me know if you know of any special or unique artists or art forms you think I should explore. I'm currently in Edmonton, Alberta in Canada and can't wait to see where PMI takes me next. Remember, push yourselves. Be kind to each other. Creativity comes from the heart. I'm Scoob Decker. And thank you for helping me pique my interest. (laughs) 